Okay, so continuing on with um, some more information uh, about Darwin and his process and, and thought process that led him to the concept of natural selection being the mechanism that drives evolution. Um, it, it wasn't an instantaneous thing. After he collected his specimens and finished his trip around the world on HMS Beagle, um, he spent a long time actually studying, uh, looking at characteristics, uh, cataloging, drawing out, taking measurements, collecting data on all the different specimens that he collected. And it was a lot. Most of his life work was actually spent at the museum in London um, um, doing these activities. And it was a long process that, that kind of helped him, that kind of got him to the point of saying, hey, natural selection. Um, but there were some thought processes that had to have occurred. Because remember, in his world, the Earth was only about 6,000 years old. And that really, there wasn't really any good science going on during uh, that time that, that would have helped change that. But turns out there, uh, right about that time, there started to be some actually really decent science. And we start seeing the developments in geography and geology and, um, and, and studying the natural world in a little bit different way. And some different concepts started coming in. And there are two major authors that Darwin actually read uh, over the course of his life that helped him dramatically uh, uh, conceive the idea of natural selection as a means for evolution. The first big author was a guy named Lyell, and he wrote a book called Principles of Geography. And it kind of just said, well, instead of the Earth being only 6,000 year, year, years old, um, it's reasonably closer to hundreds of millions of years old. And we know today that it's actually billions of years old, um, 4.5 billion years, um, and life's been on the planet for about 3.5 billion years. And that the process wasn't this quick and giant upheaval that, that um, uh, Huvier proposed with the concept of catastropheism, that this was a slow and gradual process. The slow, continuous movement of the tectonic plates is what pushed the bottoms of the oceans up to the tops of the mountains, not a quick, giant upheaval. So that book came forth, and, and there was a lot of good evidence in there that suggested that uh, that that. And so we really have the first time this concept of the Earth being way older than six thousand years, which for evolution to occur, um, we would definitely need that larger time scale. And then there's another book by uh, um, Malthus. Um, Malthus wrote a book on populations, and this and it's, it's interesting because the the populations he actually studied were um, humans in prisons. Um, but he basically said, well, let's give them limited resources and let's see what happens. Kind of did a little experiment. And when pop he basically said that when populations get too big, um, individuals are going to start competing for resources because resources are not evenly spread through an environment. There's not an equal amount of water, food, shelter, mates. There's not an even amount of that spread out. They're in clumps, right? There's some water over there and there may be food over that way, but they're not all together in one area. And so because of that, there's going to be competition, and they're going to compete for those resources. And so Darwin just took those ideas, and he put them together with the, uh, um, the ideas and, and, and the, um, the um, specimens that he co had collected during his journey, and also a lot of his just basic knowledge from him being a naturalist and studying the natural world. So imagine that you had two individuals. Easy to imagine, right? Let's just say we have two tigers. Um, they're going to compete for, for resources. This may be good, maybe space to live in, it may like territory, it may be uh, mates, it may be food. But Darwin knew that there is a variation amongst the individuals within a population. Not everybody's built the same, right? Um, not every tiger is exactly the same. So one of them is going to have traits that allows him to, 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 to do better. So individuals compete, but not all individuals are the same. The one that is more fit, the one that has that edge for whatever resource they're competing for, um, is most likely going to win. And if that's the case, then they're going to get the resource. They're most likely going to live long enough to reproduce. And when they do reproduce, they'll pass that trait to, a, to at least some of their offspring, thus giving them the opportunity to do better and so forth and so on. Um, this gradual change 
from generation to generation over a long period of time, not 6,000 years, but hundreds of millions or, or, or you know, thousands of millions of years, essentially. Um, that's what led to the, I, that's, what, that's what explains evolution. So you remember when I said that all these ancient civilizations knew that evolution um, uh, happened? They watched the world change, then they knew that animals living there had to change in order to, to, just to stay alive. But they couldn't figure out why. Well, Darwin did it. Darwin figured out why. And it wasn't just him. At the same time, again, Alfred Wallace was doing the same thing, and they both concluded that nature is capable of selection. Um, Darwin became the figurehead because he was the leading author on the book that they wrote, The Origin of Species, um, and, and he was the big proponent of it. Um, but, but Wallace was there, too, helping along the way. Um, so again, the idea is that um, uh, you have a population and there's variation within the population, right? Um, when that population faces some type of environmental uh, um, uh, variable, something happens to them. In this case, uh, with, with the caribou, um, uh, maybe it's cold or sickness that comes through. Well, some of those traits, and I think in this one, it's um, just being able to, just, to stay warmer, having the darker coat color allows you to absorb more warmth from the sun. So the ones that have the darker coat color allows them to um, uh, stay warmer and survive better. So over time, the lighter coat color is picked off, the darker coat color uh, survives a little better, and you see a change in the population for going from you know, basically half and half dark and light color to having mostly dark color. And that's why we see caribou that are mostly dark in color. Today, there I do have light variations, but they are rare. Um, and that explains it. That's, that's evolution and that's natural selection. If that kit changes like that, keep happening to all the traits in your body continuously over hundreds of thousands of years, um, we start seeing changes that are a lot more dramatic than just the change in the coat color. We start seeing um, uh, individual populations become so different from each other uh, that, that they actually become uh, two separate species because of the process of speciation. So again, because Darwin studied finches, um, his big thing was that when he studied, all, and all these finches come from the Galapagos Island, they're all very closely related to each other, and they're all very closely related to a species found on the mainland off the coast of South America. So he hypothesized that uh, a long time ago, an individual from the mainland flew out to the islands, laid her eggs, had babies, and so forth, and, and they spread out to the different islands of the Galapagos, but because the Galapagos Islands are very different from each other, different selective pressures on each island, started sculpting and shaping the beats of those individuals on those islands. So they're not randomly different from each other. The birds are specifically adapted for life on their particular island. This is a concept we call it adaptive radiation, um, which we'll talk a little bit uh, about a little bit later on. But that's his big line of evidence is, hey, look at the stuff I found, and I, I can actually explain it using natural means. Um, so this, uh, it was really that idea of common descent uh, that, that kind of made its way through during this time, um, that all these finches descended from um, uh, a common ancestor with modifications. So I'll give you another example. It's kind of strange, but here's an elephant. This is an African elephant. This is Africana Lox uh, Loxodonta africana. And this is a rock hyrax. Um, the rock hyrax and the African elephant are actually very closely related. And it's kind of weird to think about. A rock hyrax is not that big. Elephants are huge. Uh, but if you strip away the, uh, the muscles and sinews and organs and just look at the bones, the skeletal structures, they're almost identical. I mean, the hyrax looks like a little elephant. Even the tusks that are coming out of the tel elephants, uh, uh, that elephants have, um, the teeth that are coming out of this um, little rock hyrax's mouth are the same tooth. And that's unique for um, uh, members of the pachyderms. So that's a good line of evidence. If you look at the feet, they're... they're more elephantin-like and column-like than you would see for other types of rodents. Those are similarities that they share. Yes, there are differences in size, but think about a long time ago, maybe there was a small group of ancestral mammals that both of these guys shared that lived around rocks. That's why it's called a rock hyrax. There's a protection there. You can, you can run and jump between two rocks and, and get away from a predator. Um, but there's also going to be competition, right? The, the, uh, some group of uh, this, this ancient mammal that they, common ancestor that they shared, 
decided, hey, it's too crowded here. I'm going to leave, and I'm going to go out in, 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 into the forest, into the grasslands, and see if I can find a better living. And the ones that stayed behind, nature selected their traits to keep them smaller so that way they could fit inside the rocks. Because the ones that couldn't fit inside the rocks, well, that's the ones that got picked off by predators. But the ones that left, the bigger ones actually had a better chance of surviving than the smaller ones. So over millions of years of evolution, we see the, this giant change uh, between these two. But they still, remember, nature doesn't create something for nothing. It modifies a pre-existing structure. So it took the smaller frame and just simply made it larger over time. And they share those, those, those commonalities and those similarities. We can look at behavioral studies. We can look at uh, physiological studies like their bones. And we can look at DNA comparisons and say that, hey, these guys are actually related to each other. Another good thing I like to point out just real quick is that bats, because I study these with my graduate work, uh, bats are actually very, very, very adorable. They're not scary at all. Why did I put these up here? Well, everyone says bats are flying rodents, but they're actually not. They're not rodents at all. They're in their own group called Chiropteras. But if you look, look at their, you know, do a comparison, look at their anatomy and say, hey, who are these most related to? They're actually more closely related to primates than they are to, um, uh, to rodents. Um, and that's because they have hands, right? Bats have five fingers, just like me and you. They can actually reach out their wings, which is their hands, and grab something and pull it up to their face. It's really weird to watch because we're used to bird wings. But these developed from an ancient type of, uh, of, of a primitive lemur that was a part of the primate family. So we are actually more closely related to bats than bats are to rodents. That's pretty neat. 